Carlos Morales is VP of Artificial Intelligence of Ambic, which makes ultra low power chips by leveraging AI as well. Carlos, thank you so much for joining us. Just firstly, just broadly speaking, so you know that the people watching have an understanding of what it is that Ambic actually does. Can you just explain in layman's terms the, the, the processes involved in, in making these chips that are, that are different from uh, other offerings? Yes, Ambic uh, makes very low power, ultra low power uh, microcontrollers for and, and processors for IoT and endpoint devices. And when I say low power, I don't mean 10% less, 20% less power. I mean something like 10 times less power. Uh, we, we do that using a technology called a, a SPOT, sub-threshold technology, which is a way of lowering the voltage and still maintaining all the functionality of the chip. It sounds easy on paper, but it took uh, <laughs> uh, our our founder, uh, 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 brilliant uh, Scott Hansen, uh, and uh, ten years of continuous development to get to where we are today, where we, we produce something like produce over two two hundred million in the lifetime of the company. And that's obviously so important considering the, the processing power and you know just the the, the, and the energy required to to run a lot of these AI. Um, processes so the, the the question i would then ask is you know and uh, i'm sorry to get into the, the technical a little bit why isn't everyone just adopting this technology that you guys have got endpoint market is huge it's 30 billion devices are made every year you are surrounded by processors that are capable of some form of ai the reason that you don't see that very often is because ai is very computationally intense what folks like satya are talking about uh, that first inference, that first word that you type into chat GPT, something like as 10 quadrillion operations. So we're talking about megawatts of power. Endpoint AI is completely different. And it's supposed to be operate on, on batteries, it's supposed to go on your wrist, and it has to be very low power. So we're talking microwatts instead of uh, megawatts. And that's only recently, you know, the last 10 years or so that Ambic has been able to, to drop the power from normal to about one tenth of the power. So that's really opening a lot of new markets. All right, could you share numbers, Carlos? Could you substantiate by numbers in terms of how the demand environment is shaping up for you and what's the outlook thereof? Well, we're already in something like seven out of 10 wearable smartwatch manufacturers. And so that market is still growing quite a bit, but we're looking at other markets such as uh, remote patient monitoring with changing demographics of the planet and the aging of the population, the healthcare is looking more and more towards things like remote patient monitoring. The traditional way to do that is to collect a bunch of data, go back to the office and you talk to a doctor. Post-COVID, what we're seeing is a lot of analytics happening right at the house, right on your wrist. Instead of getting information about here's your ECG over 30 days, you're collecting just analytics about your electrocardiogram and you're sending only the relevant information to the doctors. And that's, uh, that's something that we need. We're not making enough doctors to keep up with population. So that's one massive uh, market that's exploding. I would say industrial IoT, we're seeing a lot of uh, interest in AI on those uh, plant monitors and so on. Uh, definitely a lot of activity. All right, I'm just looking at uh, some slides uh, that uh, reflect, uh, you know, part of uh, what you're doing. I, I also want to get a quick sense, uh, Carlos, on, uh, you know, this whole chip, glut chip shortage story, because, you know, we, we are getting kind of contradictory reports there. On the ground for uh, low power chips, what is the demand looking like do you, do you, uh, versus supply? Uh, and also entry barriers. Do you think that the IP is enough to protect your business uh, from uh, new entrants and new players? Yeah, those are two excellent questions. Um, first, the in terms of semiconductor supply, we are okay. We're, we have enough uh, capacity to meet our, our requirements. Now, if you've been following the semiconductor industry for any amount of time, there are huge uh, fluctuations. So it's even when demand is kind of, uh, you know, consumer demand is kind of a constant, manufacturing demand uh, goes up and down because of inventory buildup and then you have to burn down inventory. Um, you would think that after 30, 40 years of making semiconductors, the industry would learn, but we, you know, we haven't. <laughs> um, in terms of barrier to entry, this is not easy to do. Um, everybody, in, in, when you go to college and you study electrical engineering, they tell you, you have to stay within the voltage levels at work. And what, what our, our uh, uh, founder did and what our CEO, uh, Humi Asaka, productized 
was a way to do that at scale. Like you can do this in a lab, and uh, you know, I looked in, I worked in Silicon Valley for for 30 years. I saw a lot of people try this. What I didn't see is someone being able to make it work in every environment. The lab is fine. On your wrist is a much harder thing. And you know, beyond that, of course, everything that we invent, we 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 patent. Re really quickly, Klaus, just in terms of that as well, because obviously, you know, the, the, the high amount of energy required for these processes, you've well, and because concocted a way in which to, to make that easier by having a low power usage. How much of that is dependent on software as well? Because I would imagine because running the processes externally does help on, you know, if we're talking in terms of the cloud vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, just this immense energy load that, you know, these devices have if they were just left to run them natively. Well, and, then, and that's the beauty of it. You don't have to talk to the cloud. Your, your smartwatch is going to tell you you're having a problem without consulting a generative AI somewhere. It can, there's nothing preventing it from, but by keeping it close to your wrist or close to your smart home, you are first making it much more responsive, you are saving power because you don't have to transmit that our you know, radio frequency is expensive in terms of power, and you're pre preserving your privacy. You have more control over uh, you know, how you, what data you send and when sure. and who you send it to. Um, the software is critical. Sure. Uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm an AI guy, I'm software, so I have to, <laughs> yeah. you know, without software there's nothing, and it's Got a it. real challenge to get where we have it. Carlos, great conversation. Thank you very much for joining us uh, with your insights on the business.